Hi, my name is Ashley Holzhausen. I'm a member of the maintenance crew at Bartholomew County Public Library and a member of the Bartholomew County Beekeeping Group. This video is about pollinators in wintertime. Where do they go? What do they do? And is there anything that we can do to help them? So when we think of pollinators, although some rodents and birds do help with the pollination process. The main ones that come to mind are insects. So we'll look at some of the insects that are around this area and see where they go and what they do in the wintertime. Number one that gets the most press, honeybees. Honeybees are actually not native to North America, but they do play an important role in the pollinating process. So Honeybees do not migrate, they don't go anywhere, they stay in their hives in the winter time. And they do so by finding empty cavities in the, or empty cells in their honeycomb. And they go head first and they all group in the same general area to maintain an optimal temperatures for survival. And the only time you're gonna see the honeybees leave is when you have a slightly warm winter day and they're gonna go out to go to the bathroom and to maybe forage for water. But they are going to survive on the honey and the pollen that they've stored through the rest of the year. So they're not going to migrate. They're gonna stay in their hives that they've created, whether you are a beekeeper and have a hive set up or whether they've got a hive set up traditionally in hollowed out trees. You've also got bumblebees. Bumblebees are another common one that people know about. They do not migrate either. They stay in the area. They are native bees, but we'll talk about the group classified as native bees separately. So bumblebees specifically, only the new queens survive during the winter, and they do so by burrowing underground an inch or two into soft earth and waiting out the winter, or they might burrow into soft wood and do the same thing, and they'll emerge in springtime. Native bees as a group, these are the ones that don't get much press, but they are the pollinating powerhouses. There are over 200 species of native bees in Indiana, or in our general area as well, and they are the ones who are estimated to pollinate 80% of the flowering plants in our area. So these are the ones that get a bad rap. They get tossed under honeybees, but they're the ones who are doing the vast majority of our pollinating in our area. And these bees include mason bees, carpenter bees, sweat bees, leaf cutter, digger bees. There are a vast number of, <clears throat> excuse me, native bees that we're gonna include in the native bee category. So they tend to make their nests in hollowed out stems of dead plants that they find in the area, whether they make nests and overwinter themselves or whether they lay eggs, cap those, and those are the ones that survive. So that's what they're going to be doing is if you see a plant with a, a dead stem but it looks like there's resin or mud or something that's capping that, most likely you've got a native bee hiding out in there for winter time and they're going to emerge in spring. We also have, as pollinators go, monarch butterflies. And that's the butterfly that if someone, if you tell someone, think of a butterfly, that's typically the first one that's gonna pop to mind, the king butterfly, the monarch butterfly. Now those do not stay around this area in winter time. There are about four sets during a year of monarch butterflies that are born as they go through their, their in stars and form a chrysalis and then emerge as butterflies. There are about four generations of butterflies, of monarch butterflies throughout the summer. The last ones, typically born around August, are the ones who are going to fly south during the winter months. Monarchs that are west of the Rocky Mountains tend to hibernate or go into the insect hibernation called diapause in Southern California. 
the ones that are east of the Rocky Mountains tend to migrate all the way down to the Oyamel forests in Mexico. And that is where they're gonna cluster on trees, either in Mexico or Southern California, to stay warm. And that's where they're gonna spend the winter. And then in late March, they're going to make their migration back where they came from. Again, either the west of the Rockies, the ones that were in Southern California are going to, again, stay west of the Rockies and then the northern parts and all the way up to Canada, and the same for the eastern monarchs. So they're going to be the ones that migrate. You will not see a monarch butterfly, you will not see a monarch chrysalis, you will not see a monarch caterpillar in our area in winter time. But other moths and butterflies don't migrate. They stay here. Now whether they stay as a caterpillar or whether they stay as a, a the final stage of monarch or, or not monarch final stage of butterfly or moth or whether they pupate during the winter depends on the species so some remain as caterpillars and are something akin to bumblebees where they burrow a little bit into the ground or into soft bark or they simply stay under a leaf litter some make cocoons or chrysalis and underground in, with dead leaves. They can make their chrysalis or cocoon with dead leaves and out of dead leaves, or they make them on trees or in trees. So if those are the types of pollinators that we're gonna be examining, is there anything that we can do to help with that process? Now there are things obviously that we can do in the spring and the summer. And those are, number one, don't spray your yard because you're not only getting rid of the pest insects, you're getting rid of the good insects. You've got a lot of collateral damage. So we could, if we could just avoid spraying the yards and realize that bugs are gonna be here no matter what, we can all learn to get along. Number two, we can plant native plants. So plants that aren't necessarily those ones that are high on everyone's list because they're the popular plants of the year. But by planting plants that are naturally occurring here that have evolved here in this area, because those are the plants that the pollinators are going to have evolved with. Those are the ones that the pollinators are gonna use for food and for shelter and for nesting sites in the winter time and in the spring. But that's spring and summer stuff. So what about winter? Is there something we can do in the winter time to help the pollinators or prepare for the pollinators? Well, we could leave the leaves. So everyone is so excited <laughs> to rake their leaves or get rid of their leaves to clear off their lawn and have a clean, like, clean slate glowing, going into winter. But for those of you that mulch your leaves, yes, you are getting the benefits of that mulch leaf in your yard. But at the same time, you're destroying the habitat for a number of pollinator species. And you could even be killing pollinators themselves because for instance, luna moths make their cocoons out of dead leaves. So it looks just like a dead leaf or a dead leaf bundle, but inside is that luna moth pupa that's going to emerge in spring unless it's mulched up. So rather than mulching, rather than, than raking them out to the street for the city to pick up, rather than bagging them up, you can leave them on your yard. It's going to provide a layer of protection and insulation for the ground burrowing pollinators. And it's going to provide homes for the, the pollinators and the caterpillars that use it just as insulation and stay on the ground, but stay under a layer of leaf litter. Now you're gonna have leaves that, perhaps you've got a ton of trees in your yard and you've got 10 inches of leaves on your yard. That is going to kill your grass, true enough. 
but two, one to two inches of leaf litter is actually fantastic for your yard. It should not kill your grass. It should, in fact, uh, add nutrients to the soil without killing the grass. Now, if you have that 10 inches of leaves or some crazy amount of leaves in your yard, if you've got a spot in your yard where you can place that leaf litter, where it's not gonna hurt things like around your perennials, around your ornamental shrubs, around any kind of perennial shrub that you've got, where it's going to not hurt any shrub, not hurt any tree, not hurt any perennial, but you're going to have them collected so that it provides a habitat for those wintering pollinators. And it's gonna safely provide a place for those cocoons that have been made out of leaves or in the leaves to stay over winter time to emerge in spring. So you've got the best of both worlds. You're helping the pollinators have a place to overwinter. And as the leaves that are not part of the, the cocoons or the leaves that won't be necessary once the pollinators emerge in spring, you've got all of those nutrients for your plants and for your shrubs. So leave the leaves, let's not rake them unless absolutely necessary. Something else you can do is to postpone your pruning. So again, one of our fall tasks seems to be as a collective mind to clean up our yards, to trim back all the dead and get it prepared for winter. But by doing so, by eliminating those dead stems that maybe aren't considered attractive. We're eliminating housing and nesting sites for those overwinter, overwintering pollinators. So the native bees that use those stalks to lay their eggs or to overwinter themselves have nowhere to go. So if we leave those, not only do we provide housing and nesting sites for those pollinators, all of those dormant plants are providing a natural leaf catch as well. So the benefits we've talked about for having leaves around your yard, this is doing it for you. It's naturally collecting the leaves in your yard. It's not hurting the plants and it's providing a safe haven for these overwintering pollinators. Another thing that we can do that's a little bit controversial is to avoid those cute little bee houses that we've all seen in stores. The ones with the reeds, sometimes all of one diameter, sometimes of varying diameters that have the purpose of helping provide wintering shelters for those native pollinators. So in theory, it's a fantastic idea, but when it comes to actually doing it, there's a bit more involved. This is not a set it and forget it item. These are not ones you hang in your yard and you're good to go for the rest of your life or until it disintegrates. Unless you're planning on maintaining and cleaning these bee houses, you could actually be hurting the pollinator population by providing a breeding ground for fungus and bacteria that's going to hurt any pollinators who try to set up overwintering sites there or you could be attracting pests that are going to kill your pollinators because these items have not been properly maintained. So there are websites that you can do, you can run searches on how to properly maintain those, but they're not necessary if you follow the steps of postponing your pruning and of leaving your leaves because you're going to be providing homes naturally without adding a bee house to your landscape. And again, if you are willing to maintain and properly clean these bee houses, that's fine. But don't think that these are a set it and forget it item because they are not. Not if you truly want to help the pollinators. A last thing that you could do is to have small twigs and branches that have fallen in your yard. If you have an area where you can put those rather than burning them, rather than sending them to the, the composting recycling center, you could have a small area where those provide shelter 
and serve a similar purpose to the the dead plants that have hollow insides. So you're, if you have an area where you can keep your smaller twigs and softer wood branches, not a huge pile that's going to attract problem animals and problem pests, but small layers where you can, kind of like the one to two inch rule for leaves, about the same for these small branches and twigs that are gonna provide a cover for your ground nesting pollinators and are gonna provide housing for those ones that lay eggs and nest in the wood. So aside from those things, there's not a lot of active stuff in the winter that can be done to help pollinators. So that's why we don't think of it typically, we think of it in the spring and summer, but there are some steps that you can take in the winter to not only prepare for pollinators in the spring, but to help them survive the harsh months of winter. I'm gonna include a list at the end of this video of some native plants and resources where you can find native plants that would be beneficial as overwintering shrubs, overwintering flowers, and food sources during the spring and summer. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me and I hope you found this helpful. Thanks. Thank you.